Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here and welcome you to Drumminus this morning. If you're visiting with us, it's super to have you here. We trust you feel at home and welcome as we meet together for worship this morning. Also, those of you who are listening online and maybe get the chance to listen later on in the day, um, we continue to pray that folks who maybe haven't been able to get back um, with us on a Sunday morning, that over time you'll find yourselves back here as we meet together for worship. A few things to highlight by way of announcements. First of all, that Youth Fellowship is on tonight at 7.45 in the hall. So young folks of secondary school age, Youth Fellowship's on tonight. Then during the week on Tuesday night, it's not on the sheet, but our ladies group, Inspire, are having a movie night at eight o'clock. Um, so that's for all the ladies in the congregation this Tuesday at eight o'clock. On Wednesday, if you missed the question time over at, what well, was here on Wednesday night past, um, our question time is at Red Rock on Wednesday night of this week. And we would encourage you, if you, you missed out there at Tremendous, you can come across to Red Rock. Next Saturday is the marriage preparation course, which we host on behalf of the presbytery here from 9.30 to 3.30. If there would be anybody who would be willing to, we have about 10 or 11 couples, so it'll be about 20, just over 20 people. If there's anybody who would be willing to help provide soup for a light lunch, um, could you speak to me? We've sorted for scones at coffee time, um, and I think we've maybe one soup for lunchtime. If there were a couple of folks who said, yeah, look, I'll, I'll bring down soup and help serve that just for the three quarters of an hour at lunchtime for the couples who are at the marriage preparation class, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, speak to me afterwards or speak to me later on today um, so that we can provide that. It's just a um, soup and a roll at lunchtime on Saturday next weekend. That's an opportunity um, for somebody to help out and serve in that way. Next weekend, um, we come to the first weekend in April, and our topic changes. Um, this month, we've been thinking about reading God's Word, and more of that in a moment. But next Sunday, we start into a series for the, the Easter month, focusing on getting to grips with the gospel. Why this message that we preach is so central to all that we are, and all that we do, and all that we want to proclaim to the world. So next Sunday, we'll be starting that series, and as our kickoff in that series. Next Sunday night at 6.30 over in Red Rock, we have our real life faith informal Sunday evening service. Can I encourage you, um, on the way out the door, when you go home, have a conversation with whoever you've come with. Say, yeah, we should go to that next Sunday night. Um, two of my close friends, Niall and Serena, will be with us next Sunday night, sharing about their life, their work, their faith, some of their struggles. Um, and how the good news of the gospel um, covers all of those things. So that's next Sunday night. Um, please come over to Red Rock, half past six. It's very informal. Um, there'll be a cup of coffee and a biscuit, and Niall and Zarina I'll be talking to for half an hour. Important announcement to pass on the information. We were to have a committee meeting on Tuesday, the 5th of April. I'm going to have to postpone that. Um, when you're minister of two churches, you sometimes get double booked. BB at Red Rock are having their prize evening that particular night and I'll be needed at Red Rock and um, so tremendous committee we're going to have to um, probably shift back a week towards Easter and um, I'll clarify that with one or two and then um, announce that subsequently. Finally um, with regards to gift aid um, Noel has put an announcement on and it's been there a couple of weeks but we want to just highlight it again um, if anyone has a, a change in their arrangements regarding gift aid you've maybe moved house so your address has changed or you're no longer employed and paying tax um, in which case then we won't have to take your name off our um, gift aid and, and applying for that from the tax man or if you have joined the congregation and you're a taxpayer and you would like Draminis to benefit from the, the gift aid that we can claim against your contributions. If any of those matters apply, speak to Noel McKee um, and he will sort that out with you um, in the next couple of weeks. So please um, speak to Noel if there's um, any changes need to be made. Finally, as you leave this morning, um, we're thinking today about reading our Bibles. 
It's not really going to be a sermon this morning. The sheet of paper you got in your pew is a page out of Explore Bible Reading Notes. And we're going to journey through that together in the sermon slot this morning. And then as you leave, there's a copy of Explore for everybody. If husband and wife want to say, look, one, one will do us, well, then that's grand. And um, you don't have to take two. Um, if on the other hand, you say, no, look, I think it would benefit in my house or your house if we did nobody's going to be checking that you only took one. Um, so they're, they're in, the, vestib- they're in the, the outer foyer, and we want you to take one and make use of it as you read God's Word. Maybe you get Explore already. I'm sorry, that's the only present I've got this morning for you. So if you already get that and use that, and you don't want to take one, that's all right. But we, we want to hand one out to everybody uh, so that you can make use of them. And also tied in with that are boys and girls have been getting books this morning to help them um, read the Bible and help them think about God's great love for us in Jesus. If your child hasn't got a book, if they're a preschooler, nursery school, you know, infant, maybe not even at nursery school, there's a table in the, the foyer there with books with their name, tiny writing, you'll see it stuck on, and um, please sort that out. And Sunday school teachers have the books for those who maybe weren't here this morning, and they will get them in due course. But more of that um, as we go along. We're not here for announcements, as you know. We're here to worship God, and we're going to do that as we stand and sing together. We're going to sing God has spoken by his prophets, spoken his unchanging word, each from age to age proclaiming God the one, the righteous Lord. I'm thankful this morning that when I stand in the pulpit and sometimes um, I don't get my words right, sometimes my brain gets a bit fuzzy, sometimes, and you might say it's every week, Sam, it's, it's not a very good sermon, but it's not my words that matter. It's God's word. It's God who meets with us this morning to speak to you by his Holy Spirit through his living word. And so from the off, we're singing, thanking the Lord this morning that he has spoken and his word is truth. Let's use our voices to sing our praise to him. God has spoken. Let's take our seats together. As we sing, um, we are praising God who is present with us. As we pray, God has told us that he's made a way that we can come to him through Jesus. 
and talk to him. So let's quiet our minds and our hearts and let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we quieten our hearts before you this morning and we thank you for this place and for this day where we gather together to give you the praise and the worship that you alone deserve. There is no other God but you. You're unchanging, you're perfect, holy, pure. And so Lord, we come to you and we bow and we bring you our praise and we acknowledge your goodness and your grace to us. Father, I thank you this morning that you're the Lord who speaks. Father, I thank you that all of creation and its beauty and glory is a testimony to who you are. And even in the week that has passed, as we see winter give way to spring, we're, we're reminded that you've promised that season will follow season. And you will be faithful in that until Christ returns. Lord, thank you this morning for the book we have in our hands, the living and enduring, unchanging word of God. Father, I thank you that you've spoken by the prophets and the apostles. And your word is truth. Lord, I pray this morning that in a, a new way for each of our hearts, we would come surrendered to that truth, submitting to what you tell us and to how you lead us. Lord Jesus, we come today so thankful that in the fullness of time you came. God's word made flesh to live among us, to die for us. And so, Lord, today we come and we thank you for Jesus. Lord, for those of us who've been Christians for many years, we thank you that Christ died for us. We thank you that by the Holy Spirit, you've brought us to new life in him. And so, Lord, this morning, we want to rejoice again in the good news that saved us. And Lord, maybe for some of us this morning, and this message is still something we've heard from our childhood, something that there's an inkling of heart that there's truth in this. So, Lord, I pray this morning that by the Holy Spirit, you would be speaking again, drawing our hearts and our minds to Jesus, that we might see him, that we might come repentant before him, that we might trust him. So, Lord, we pray. We thank you for bringing us together in this way this morning. Father, I thank you that for each of us, this is a divine appointment that you have inst inst instigated. And so, Lord, I pray that today, as your word is opened, your voice would be heard, and our hearts would be responsive and trusting, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're going to read this morning um, from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 to 31, so if you want to look that up in our pew Bibles, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 to 31, and it's going to be read for us by Jennifer McQuirter. So 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 31, and Jennifer is going to read God's word for us. It's on page 1144 in our pew Bibles. The reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded signs and Greeks looked for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles and to those whom God has called, both Jews and, and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God 
is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential, and not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Jesus Christ who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Thank you, Jennifer. Now, boys and girls, where are you? I need my bag, first of all, and one or two other bits and pieces. Among many things today, first of all, today is the day that you get or got less sleep. Who is feeling a bit tired? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit tricky, isn't it? What, is, what else is it today? First hand up, go for it, Bronwyn. Mother's Day, absolutely, and you're sitting pretty close to mummy, aren't you? It is Mother's Day. It's a very special day. Um, all of you who are mummies, um, we give a shout out at this stage and acknowledge you in various roles that you fulfill. We'll come more to that in a minute. But first of all, boys and girls, and you've got to be honest here, has anybody forgotten that it was Mother's Day or forgotten to get something for their mummy? <laughs> okay, there's some nodding. What sort of things could you get for your mummy on Mother's Day to say you love her or to say thank you? Okay, go for it, Megan. A card, that's one thing, yeah. Scott's going to give me another one. Um, bed and breakfast. Bed and, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Send her away for bed and breakfast or bring her breakfast to bed breakfast to bed yeah that sounds good don't know if you got that or not Claire but no oh well okay we'll get more hands up Zach flowers, flowers. okay Zach do you want a flower for your mummy okay there you are good man go for it <laughs> you're welcome there you are there's there's one mummy that'll go very well with the green shirt there that's lovely we'll make you pin it on Lynn. happy Mother's Day Okay, what else, what else could we get? Somebody mentioned a card. Be honest, did anybody forget to write a card? Did you, Amy? Did you forget? Or if you, did you give your mummy a card? Would you like to give your mummy an extra? Would you like to give her an extra card? Okay, come on. Let's see what I can find in here. Let's see. There, look, there's a card with flowers on it. It's got nothing inside, but you could write a nice Mother's Day message to your mummy. And I think Mummy Julie would like that, wouldn't she? Right, okay. So you take that. Good girl. That's that, that one sorted. What else can you get on Mother's Day? What else do mummies like? Jensen's hands up. Oh, Jensen, don't mummies like sweeties? Would you like some sweeties to bring to your mummy? Come on. Tell your mummy happy Mother's Day. <laughs> now, you're welcome. Now, it's for your mummy, Jensen, okay? <laughs> Have I got... The gospel is the foolishness of, of God. Have I got fool written across my head this morning? Yeah, I know Jensen is an honorable young man, and that will go to his mummy. You see, these are all sorts of ways that you can say, Mummy, I love you. Mummy, thank you. Mummy, you're great. But what other things can we do to, to show our mummies that we love them? Da, yeah, okay, Scott's going to help me. Um, oh, tid tidy your room. That, that, yeah, tidy your own room would be a good idea, wouldn't it? Rosie's got an idea. Give them a hug, Give them a hug is a lovely idea. Be a slave all day. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Megan. <laughs> You're going to just work really hard, are you? To tidy the house. And... Any other ideas what you can do for your mummy? Okay, now, I'm going to tell you something. 
can I, how good are your memories? Are they pretty good? Here's three ways to love your mummy on Mother's Day. Can you tap your wrist and pretend you're looking at your watch? Spend time with your mummy. And so I'm gonna throw that in whether you're five or 14 or 18 or 27 or 52, spend time with the people you love. Today we're thinking about Mummy's Day, but that could be somebody else that you love and who has cared for you and been good to you. Spend time with them. That's a way of showing, you, showing them that you love them. Spend time, that's the first one. What are these things for? Not just for earrings, what else are they for? Or for AirPods. Jethro? Listening, yeah. Another way to show your mum or your dad or anybody that you love them is to listen. When they're talking to you, listen. Boys and girls, God gave you mummies and daddies and grandparents and aunties and uncles to give you wisdom. And so you listen to them. And I'm going to give you one last thing. And you can hold out your hands. Because your hands that you do things with, our parents give us instructions and we're to obey them. Boys and girls, if you're a boy or girl at home, you're still at school, God has given you a mummy and daddy to give you instructions. Show your parents that you love them by listening to them, by obeying them, by following their instructions. Spend time with them, listen to them, obey them. Do you know what the thing that really hits me this morning? God tells us in his word that if we love him, then we'll listen to him. If we love him, we'll want to spend time with him. And whether that's being at church or opening up our Bibles ourselves or praying even as we walk and go about. I was talking to somebody during the week and they said to me, Sam, I do a lot of praying when I'm just moving about each day in the kitchen, up the corridor, when I go out for a walk, when I'm driving, not with their eyes closed. They talk to God. They spend time with God. And God says to us in his word, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. Mother's Day is a great day. Um, special days like this when we thank God for our loved ones are super, super days. But can I remind you this morning, show the people that you love them, especially your parents, boys and girls, by spending time with them, listening to them. And if you're still a boy or a girl at home, obeying them. That's God's instruction for you. And he wants you to spend time with him and listen to him and obey him. That's how you prove that you love him. It's all very well saying, oh, I love God, or I go to church every now and again. God says, if you love me, you'll listen to me. You'll obey my commands. Now, we're going to watch a little video that shows us some Bible mummies and the way that they loved God. So we're going to watch this together. Happy Mother's Day, Sarah. After waiting to have a child for so many years, you must be overjoyed to have Isaac. Today is about you and all those who are still waiting. Happy Mother's Day, midwives of Israel. You risk your own safety to ensure the survival of countless children. Today is about you and all those who care for children and call it work. Happy Mother's Day, daughter of Pharaoh. By welcoming Moses into your family, you showed so much love Today is about you and all foster and adoptive parents. Happy Mother's Day, Naomi. You walked with Ruth as a friend and cared for a child as your own grandchild. Today is about you and all grandmothers and extended family who care for children. Happy Mother's Day, Hannah. You let go of Samuel, even though it hurt you. Today is about you and all those whose children are not living with them right now. Happy Mother's Day, Anna. Life didn't go as you had hoped, yet you found peace and worth in your service to God. Today is about you and all those experiencing heartache at how things have turned out. Happy Mother's Day, Lois and Eunice. Your faith changed Timothy's life. Today is about all those who are playing a part in raising the next generation. Mother's Day is about you, whatever your role might be.
Now, I want to take a little minute to pray, um, and that may include today praying for and about mummies in the various roles that they have. Um, there are so many things that even just come up in that little video that we want to think about even as we pray, and we pray for extended families. We pray um, for those who have children and with those children problems. We pray for those who wish they had children and the heartache that that brings. Um, we want to pray this morning for mummies under all sorts of pressure, um, whether they're young mummies or older mummies. We want to pray about the gospel and our mummies um, and the responsibility that parents have to share the good news with their children. And I, I can't find myself praying this morning about mothers without thinking about the mums in Ukraine and the mummies who are trying to raise their children, some on the run away from their homes, some underground. Um, and even this morning, I know, and I don't always get it right in my words from the pulpit, I know that even the very mention of Mummy's Day or Mother's Day is, brings back some good memories, some sad memories, some heartache for somebody. And so we want to pray this morning, thankful that even as the little video reminded us, there was Anna in the Bible, and things hadn't quite worked out the way that she had hoped, but God still loved her, and she knew that. So let's pray, and let's pray for each other, um, conscious of all the various emotions that rage about in these moments. Let's pray. Father, we still our hearts before you, and it's sometimes hard to know exactly the right thing to pray. But I thank you that it's you by the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us and even guides us in our praying. Lord, we want to thank, thank you today for mums and mothers in our congregation, those who have loved us and brought us up and taught us and pointed us in the right direction. Lord, I pray this morning for heartache that various mums go through some broken-hearted over prodigal sons and daughters, some wishing that they could be a mother, some fearful. And Lord, even for some of us this morning, as we, we think about this day, it just hurts us because we've lost somewhere along the way our mum. And today there is a sadness as well as a gladness. Lord, we want to pray today for all those who have responsibility with children, especially for our Christian mummies. Lord, give them courage to speak the good news to our young people, to read God's word, to pray with our children. Father, we pray this morning for the mums in Ukraine, many of whom have had to leave their husbands behind and go into hiding or go to a foreign country. Lord, I pray that today they might know that you shield them and shelter them. And as we turn to you, you're with us wherever we go. Father, I thank you today that no matter what our ups and downs, whatever emotions overwhelm us this morning, you've told us that we can turn to you and find refuge in you, that you never leave us or forsake us or let us die. So, Lord, I pray today that for each of us we would find our home and our happiness in trusting Jesus. Lord, all these things we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now, we're going to, to sing together. Um, and and the, the words of this song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. God's word on every page is reminding us of his love for us and what he has done for us. Um, and he points us in the way that we can go so that one day we will be with him. That's what this song's about. So let's stand and sing together. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Let's stand as we sing.
Now, as we, we take our seats, boys and girls, um, if you want to go out to Children's Church, now's the time to do that, and you'll be looked after and organized out in the hall. So if you want to go um, that direction now, that would be super. And as the boys and girls are doing that, can I get mums and dads and everybody else who's left in the pews to check, have you got a piece of paper um, somewhere near you you can put your hand on? Um, somebody can maybe help me. Um, Johnson, is there anybody out in the, the room out there? Because if there are, we can send pieces of paper that direction if they haven't got. Um, I'm not sure if anybody slipped into the, the red room. What we want to do this morning, um, totally different. And so, um, uh, Johnson, anybody next door need a sheet? Yep, super. One of the lovely things um, about even last week having Graham with us in preaching, it's good for you to hear a different voice in the pulpit. And this morning it is not a sermon. Um, so don't go home after, there's no sound, didn't preach a sermon today. Um, there have been plenty of Sundays where you said, oh, the sermon was this or the sermon was that. So today you're not getting a sermon. Um, and so don't even think about the next 20 minutes as a sermon. It's not. We've given the boys and girls this morning um, something to help them in their reading the Bible. As you leave this morning, um, you'll get one of these little books, and it's marked from April to June um, 2022, so that's timely. It starts um, during the week, and it has a daily page with a Bible reading and some information and some guidance to take you through the Bible passage that you're reading. And so what I thought would be helpful this morning is to take one, so that photocopied bit in the middle of your sheet is from um, the... Explore Bible reading notes. Actually, I think the date on it's Sunday, the 17th of October. So that was October last year. Um, and what I've done is I've photocopied that. And then I've sort of put some of my bits and pieces and thoughts and scribbles around it. So apologies for my handwriting. But what I want to do is just take a few minutes this morning. And I'm not going to get you to put your hand up and ask, tell me, do you read your Bible daily? Some of you I know do. Others of you have said to me, Sam, I read my Bible, but I don't always understand what I read. I was talking to somebody recently who told me they've read through the whole of the Bible in the last year. And I thought, brilliant, super. Some of you use Bible reading notes like this to help you, or a thought for the day book that maybe gives you a Bible passage and then encourages you to, to think about that. Some of you have an app on your phone, and um, you can get Explore as an app on your phone if you want to do that. Um, but what we want to do is give these out this morning and encourage you in reading God's Word. So do you see along the top there are half a dozen little circles? Let me just say a word about that first of all. Find a time you can read the Bible each day. Some people read the Bible first thing in the morning. They get up, their mind is bright and alert, and they've got, if you're a half six riser and you've got an hour's peace before you do everything else, that's great. We're not all like that. Some of us, it's something that we do towards the end of the day. And I know several of you have told me, yeah, you, you set aside time if you're a mummy and you've got wee people and there's maybe half an hour's pace at half eight or nine, that's when you read and pray. Maybe somebody else, it's on lunch break and you, you've your Bible with you, good, that's super. Find a time that works for you. Find a place where you can be quiet and think. I've often found that I, I read my Bible notes and I find then it's as I go about during the day, maybe go for a walk. Sometimes that's when I pray and I really say, Lord, you've spoken to me through your word and I want to talk to you about this. Find a place that you can be quiet. Ask God to help you understand. Um, God is our teacher. God doesn't hide. I know some of you have said to me, oh, but the Bible's very hard to understand. Some of it is. But God's not hiding. God's not trying to be confusing. He wants us to get to know him better. And so we pray and we say, Lord, help us. Let the Holy Spirit teach me as I open your word. Then carefully read through the Bible passage. It's very easy to skim read things. Take time when you're reading God's word. And then what they suggest in their little booklet is study the verses using Bible reading notes and take time to think and then pray about what you've read. So this morning, Jennifer has read for us the passage that is in this little section. And for the next few minutes, what I'm gonna do is work my way through it and say a few things as we go. So it's called the power of the cross. This was Sunday, the 17th of October. It's not nice to feel like a fool. 
and I've, I've on many occasions felt really foolish. But sometimes we need to remember that that's exactly what we are. So this is about realizing that the gospel is not about being clever. Sometimes in life we, we like being proud and thinking we're the bright boy. The gospel's not about that. So in the, the reading that preceded this, in yesterday's reading, Paul said that he speaks not with wisdom and eloquence, and there were lots of people in Paul's day who were brilliant speakers, who gave wonderful speeches with special flowery language. Paul says, I'm not like that. I just want to, to speak the truth. And his communication method seemed foolish to people around him. And today that we see in our Bible reading, that's not just the me method, the message seems foolish as well. So we read the Bible reading, and it's all about the cross. It's all about Jesus' death. And so the first little question that, and you see in our um, Explore Bible notes, sometimes there's a little question mark. Why might people think that the message of Jesus' death on the cross seems like foolishness? So I, you stop and you think, why does the message of the cross seem somewhat foolish? Well, I thought about it as I was reading. For one, Jesus was the leader. Jesus was the man that the disciples were following. How does it make sense that the leader dies? How does it make sense that the person who's supposed to be strong dies? That seems like a weak thing. And so I can say, yeah, this, this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, humanly speaking. The message seems foolish. So that's why I scribble at the side, death doesn't seem very powerful. But look at your Bible reading, and it's on the screen. You can see in verse 18, and then the guys, let's read verse 18, um, that second little question. What does this message of the cross have power to do? Verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Flick on to the next page, guys, and you'll see in the Bible reading in verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Do you see the, the word that crops up twice in verse 18? Saved in verse 21, this message of the cross, um, as it is preached, the possibility of being saved or rescued for those who believe. And so I'm, I'm reading my Bible notes and I'm going, oh, wait a minute. This message that seems to be foolishness, that Jesus dies, is actually the very thing that God is using deliberately so that you and I might be saved. And, and we, we throw around a word like saved, stop for a wee minute. What does it mean? It means to be rescued. We deserve to be punished, but God in Christ is, is, is willing and able to rescue us. So let me stop off from this for a wee minute just to say something else. The message that Paul preached and that thousands of other preachers have preached is the message that I preach and proclaim to you. It may seem foolish and weak. Surely this can't make sense that the leader dies. Surely this is weak. Death looks in the world's eyes like defeat. And yet God is crystal clear in his word. To those who are being saved or rescued, it's God's power. It brings forgiveness. It brings peace with God. It gives us a new life and power to live that new life. And, and we read in verse 21, God is pleased to save those who believe. The, the connection between what God has done in Christ and how it might change you or me is faith. When we receive by faith what God has done for us in Christ, God says, that's why this message is so significant and so powerful. It can save you and change you. So that's the first thing. Let's go to the third little, do you see a third little question mark down the left-hand side? How has the wisdom of the world failed by comparison? Verse 20 and 21. Let's go back to our Bibles. Um, it's on the screen. Let's go back to verse 20. And so Paul is writing, and he's saying he's spoken about the cross, and now he says, where is the, the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this, of this age? What happens in the end to every person who has ever lived? What happens? You can't shout out at this stage. 
what, what, what is the end of all of us? We die. Yeah, Megan, thank you. I thought nobody was going to answer my question and you were about to help me. We die. And Paul is writing and he's saying, listen, no matter how clever the scholar is, no, no matter how wise the wise man, no matter how educated the philosopher, at the end of the day, they're going to die. You see, there's a, our cross, which may seem foolishness, actually has a message that deals with the one huge problem that faces all of us as human beings. So that's my second stop off this morning. No matter how wise the wise man, no matter how intelligent the intelligent person, no matter how clever the clever person, in the end, they come to die too. Where are they now? Paul is asking, well, they're dead. Because no matter how wise you are, no matter how clever you are, in the end, you die. And yes, at times there are people who tangle us up with their cleverness, they wriggle out of our questions about faith and they, they explain it away. Maybe they mock us. Maybe they make us feel stupid for what we believe. But in the end, one out of one dies. For all their wisdom, for all their cleverness, at the end of the day, it's of no value when you face the end. Instead, the gospel points me and steers me to trust the one who died and rose again for me. The message of the cross is the message of death defeated because Jesus rose. And that's the second little thing that if I was reading this as my Bible notes, I would be going, yeah, there are people in the world who are clever and smarmy and smart and, and think they can reason away my faith. But in the end, death comes. I know one and I've trusted one who has died for me and who has risen. We have a hope in the face of death we have an answer to life's biggest question. So let me go back and just read what, I was, what we read in the notes. G Jewish people were looking for signs that would prove Jesus' power, just like many people today look for spiritual experiences. Greek people prized wisdom and knowledge. A crucified Messiah looks like a complete contradiction to Jews, an utter lunacy to everybody else. Yet this turns out to be both God's power and his wisdom. Now, when you're going through the, the Bible notes, sometimes there's a little box, do you see, near the bottom of the left-hand column, and it says, apply. This is where you want to take a minute or two to think about how the message applies to you. And so they ask a few questions, and I want to just read those questions and then maybe reflect on them for a little minute. Why does the message of the cross seem like foolishness to unbelievers today? Well, when we mention the cross, just think for a wee minute what you mean by the cross. You mean a implement of execution that was used 2,000 years ago by the Romans. Most people say, are you telling me that your faith, your whole life, you've bet everything on this execution of a man who lived 2,000 years ago? I can sort of understand why people think that's foolishness, but that's our gospel. I, I think people find it foolish because when you push God to the margin of life, you think, well, there's nobody really that I'm accountable to. I do what I want. So if a Christian talks about sin uh, and that we deserve to be punished for our sin, most people that you and I know who are not Christians think that's nonsense. That's old fashioned and outdated. So I can sort of understand why people think this message is strange. To, to modern ears, it seems that way. And then it asks the question, does it ever seem foolish to you? Maybe we want to think about that personally. How can this passage encourage you to stand firm in your faith? How will it help you to pray for the salvation of those around you? I think that sometimes the message of the cross and the foolishness of the cross seems harder difficult to take is because we like to do it ourselves. We're naturally proud. We like to think, I can sort it out myself. I can fix it myself. In everything else in life, I can earn my way. I can have people applaud me. The cross makes you set all that down and realize you can do nothing to make yourself right with God. And so I'm beginning to think a wee bit more about the cross as I read my Bible passage. Another little hop off for you, just coming away from the notes for a minute. When I read the Bible passage, when I look at the questions and I stop and I think and I apply it to myself, it's what I would call the so what slot. 
Um, do you remember Christianity Explored? And um, we used to have a three or four minute called the so what slot. What difference does this make? Can I ask you something this morning in the so what slot? You might read the Bible and go, okay, so the cross is God's wisdom. I accept that. So the cross is God's power. I accept that. This is God's way. Okay, I see that. Life through death. Here's a question. Have you done anything about that? Every single one of us, have you done something about the message that you've heard? Because there is no other way to be made right with God other than through the cross. There is no hope for life beyond the grave other than through the cross. There's no other name by which you can be rescued or saved other than Jesus and his death at the cross. And maybe you're here this morning, you're thinking, ah, but I don't need this. I'm a good Protestant. I'm a good person generally. Ah, Sam, sure, aren't we all Christians? Or Sam, I have my own beliefs. Just let me stop you there. That is you saying, I have my own wisdom. I have my own beliefs. Uh, you, you maybe think that's sort of a pretty humble sort of way compared to the clever, educated, philosophery sorts. But when you say, I have got my own beliefs, you're essentially setting your beliefs up and against God's wisdom of the cross and saying, I know better. You know better than God. If you're saying this morning that you've got your own beliefs about faith and, and how it works. God says, no, this is my wisdom. This is my power. And there's no other way. Ultimately, your eternity is at stake over what you do with this message. There's no way through the grave to everlasting life without personally coming to the cross and putting your trust in Jesus. There's no way of escaping judgment and hell without personally receiving by faith Christ in my place at the cross. There's no way of living in a way that pleases God and honors God without the power that comes when we put our trust in God and by the Holy Spirit, he comes and dwells in us to change us from the inside out. It's, it's all through the cross. And so you can't read a passage like this without stopping and going, well, where do I stand in relation to this? Have I received the good news of the gospel and put my trust in Christ? Have I been to the cross and seen that Jesus died for me and I've come and I've prayed and I've said, Lord, forgive me. Lord, turn me round accept me, change me. Each of us needs to go there. Let me follow through then, and this is really the last little bit on the other side of the page. The punchline, and this is really interesting. Having shown the foolishness of Christian preaching and the Christian message, it seems like foolishness to the world, Paul moves on to his masterful punchline, the Corinthian church's very existence is foolish. I put a wee smiley face um, because sometimes church can seem really silly. That made me laugh. Um, we are such a, a bunch. I am one off the bunch. And I sometimes wonder and smile, how is God doing his eternal wonderful work through the church? Because we're nothing special. And so the question that we're asked as we think about this passage is, what's foolish or unimpressive about the church? Look up verse 26. You'll see it on the screen, and it'll come through. There it's on the screen. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. You see, um, can you think what some of the disciples did before they became followers of Jesus? The boys up in Galilee that put the boats out, what did they do? Shout, yeah, go for it, Rosie. They were fishermen, yeah. Fishermen were your ordinary average boils. That's what they did for a living, they fished. Some of the other disciples were, there was one was a tax collector and people didn't like him. There was another was an ex-paramilitary and people had good reason to be suspicious of him. There was at least one of the ladies who followed Jesus who had a bit of a dubious past. They weren't much in the world's eyes. In fact, that God would entrust to them the message of the gospel and the good news for the salvation of all who would believe, it seems crazy when you think about who the first believers were. And yet God takes them, and it may seem in the world's eyes feeble and useless, and these people aren't very important. And that little second question mark, what do you think would have made, what, 
that would make people think about Christians and Christianity. Well, the very fact that these are very ordinary people, they're not educated, will not listen to them. The very fact that some of them had a checkered past will not listen to them. The very fact that some of them had jobs that, that made them go around and take money off people will not listen to them. It, it just seems like such a contradiction in terms. Interestingly, there's nothing new under the sun. There's plenty of people point the finger and say, those Christians, they're not very impressive. Those Christians are hypocritical. Those Christians are not very clever. Those, nothing has changed. But God says the message of the cross is the wisdom and the power of God. What does Paul say their unimpressiveness actually proves? Let's go to verse 27. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not or nothing to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. You see, salvation, this gospel good news, is all of what he has done, not what I do. That's at the very heart of this message. And so God, in pulling out this gathering of ragtag people who he called to himself, who put their trust in him, in the very nature of who they were, God is saying, it's not about them, it's about me. I, I think if there was one thing that hit home to me more than anything else as I did this as my little Bible study to share with you this morning, let's read what it says. God has demonstrated his wisdom among these weak, poor, uneducated believers so powerfully that the smartest people on earth are left scratching their heads. And Paul finishes by saying, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. See, I arrowed off to the side in the wee zigzaggy box. You don't have to be clever. We don't go around boasting, oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, look what I do. Look how good I am. The very heart of the message makes you and me realize how not good we are and how much in need of God's grace we are. It's a message that humbles us and strips away our pride. And so this is my last jump off, and then we finish. Hear me on this. I'm inclined to understand and focus on the fact that the cross is God's power. I get that. Jesus bears my sin, so I'm made clean. I'm hidden and included in him. His righteousness is mine. The Holy Spirit comes to live in me. That gives me the power to live God's way. I get that. That's the gospel is the power of God. But Paul is also saying that the gospel is the wisdom of God. And God's message is wise in many ways. But what hit me as I prepared for this morning is this. The cross is God's free gift that humbles and sobers us all and equalizes us as people. Wealth doesn't get you in. Being able to say, oh, I'm morally good and better than the other man doesn't get you in. Being upwardly mobile and having social privilege, no advantage. Being highly educated and mentally top grade and top of the class doesn't get you in. Isn't it amazing in the wisdom of God, the way to relationship with him is not through any of the, the qualities, attributes, and stuff that the world thinks are the way to get ahead. God's gospel, God's way, means that the youngest child, or the least educated, or the poorest, or the socially non-influential stands equal before the highly educated, the wealthy, the person who thinks they're great. All of these advantages and privileges at the cross are stripped away. At the end of the day, each of us are accountable to God. Each of us are sinners in need of salvation. All of us are in desperate need because we face the ultimate enemy, which is death. And we're ultimately, utterly dependent on God's grace and mercy. How wise and great is the God we adore. The gospel is his wisdom as well as his power. So I, I open up my Bible and I find myself praying at the end, what aspect of the cross moves me the most? I'm not going to answer that for you. You can think about that this morning. Spend some time praising God for this foolish message. What I've scribbled at the bottom of the page, and I'll leave this with you, as I read this passage for myself, as I would, as I would open up my Bible and read each day, I've learned that the cross is how God gets his work done, even still today. For me, 
and in me and in the world. There is no other message. That reminds me again. That gives me my solid rock. And so as I, I think about that, I'm going, hey, wait a minute. I want other people to meet and trust Christ crucified. So I'm going to speak this message when I get the opportunity. I'm going to pray for the people in my family who don't yet know Jesus as Savior, who, who are living their lives with no regard for Christ crucified, the wisdom and power of God. I want them to know. And if there was one verse in the passage that I would try and learn, it's this. We preach, and it's not just ministers, we proclaim is what the word means. We proclaim Christ crucified, the wisdom and power of God. It challenges my pride. I can't, by my own strength, get right with God. No gifts or wisdom that I have can put me right with him. It's all about him. And it's all about the cross. The power and the wisdom of God. And so there in, what, 20 minutes? Maybe 23 or 4. I've gone through the Bible passage. And what I want to encourage you, look, take these home with you. Each day has got one of those. Um, somebody really kindly at one stage said to me, Sam, I read my Bible and it's great and I love hearing God's word, but I wish that I had somebody beside me, like a minister, and I'm going, oh, not me, somebody beside me to, to explain what I'm reading. This is your companion beside you to help you understand what you're reading. If you love the Lord, you'll want to obey his commands. If you love the Lord, you'll want to read his word. But you'll also want to understand it. And so take this home. If even out of today, one or two, if you go, yeah, I'm going to get into reading God's word. I want to understand it. I want to get to know him better. Even particularly today, that message, this cross, it's the wisdom and the power of God. And so I can't not finish by saying, have you put your trust in Jesus Christ crucified? It's the only way. He is the only way to be made right with God and to know everlasting life. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word, for its living truth. I thank you, Father, that we're privileged to live in a part of the world where we have Bibles in our hands and good resources like Explorer and other Bible notes to help us read. Lord, I pray today that maybe for some of us this morning, there's a real move in our hearts from you to set aside time each day to really dig into your word. Father, I pray that we would set out to do that. And yes, there'll be days that we forget. There'll be days that we're too busy. There'll be days that we get lazy. But Lord, I pray, keep calling us back. Help us to open up your word and help us to meet you there. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to finish as we sing together. How deep the Father's love. I chose this because of the last verse. Um, I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Let's stand as we sing together.
Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon us now and forevermore. Amen.